I think we can start. Uh, good morning, dear participants. Welcome to session 6A. My name is Bedr Özer. I am from Turkey, Fırat University, which is in Turkey. I am the chair of this session. Uh, the session topics are system engineering and computer technology. We have five uh, presentation in this session. Uh, the first uh, presentation title is Fast Statical Image Binarization of Color Images for the Recognition of QR Codes. The presenter is Mr. Okarma from Poland. We invite him. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> well, the presentation is related strictly to image processing and image analysis. Uh, to be uh, exact, uh, the main topic is uh, the binarization, which is an important step of many image recognition and analysis applications. Uh, I have focused with my co-author, Piotr Lech, is my colleague from the same department, uh, we work for the Faculty of <laughs> Electrical Engineering uh, in West Pomeranian University of Technology in Szczecin. It's northwestern part of Poland, 150 kilometers from Berlin. We are closer to Berlin, Copenhagen and Prague than our capital Warsaw. It's <coughs> I think it could be interesting for some of you. <coughs> Well, we have focused on the binarization of color natural images for the recognition of quick response codes, which are, we know, they are not safe, yeah, after <laughs> yesterday's <laughs> um, uh, first session, but uh, they are very useful, especially, especially for mobile devices. Uh, uh, so, as you probably know, the main idea of two-dimensional QR codes is the quick response. So the recognition of such codes should be fast. Uh, as we know that some, in some cases uh, we have the natural images which can be illuminated in various ways, uh, which can be just color. They are not necessarily only black and white, uh, sometimes we just have to localize the QR code and analyze the whole image in order to find the place where the code, code is located and then to m make a binarization in such a way that the quick response code could be properly recognized. So the binarization, it would be good if it could be fast as well. So. I will discuss some problems uh, in binary codes recognition, meaning the two-dimensional codes, as the example, the QR codes, because there are some other uh, systems of coding, uh, Aztec, for example. Uh, I will briefly discuss the idea and experimental results going to the conclusions. Well, so, um, We cannot imagine uh, contemporary mobile devices without the camera, without the ability to recognize the quick response codes. So it's just a sign of times we have the access to such technology. But we would like to decode the text information as fast as possible. It's stored in binary two dimensional array, but. Uh, <coughs> Good <coughs> news is that uh, there are practically no chance to decode the quick response code wrongly. We decode it well, or we do not decode uh, uh, the quick response code. Uh, <coughs> the reason is the presence of some additional correction information um, using the read Solomon's code, which preserve 
the integrity of data. So uh, even if we try to estimate something, uh, we can try just try to make attempt to recognition. Is it suc successful or not? Yeah, it is impossible to almost impossible to decode it wrongly. So, of course, two-dimensional codes are uh, more and more popular in various applications. Uh, for commercial purposes, we can find it almost everywhere. Uh, but uh, if we consider it, it as a reliable and useful technology, we should remember that it is very useful when we can predict quite good lighting conditions and generally, let's say, good quality of the input image. Yeah? There is not a problem to recognize such code, but the problem could be related to code localization, where is the code in the big image. This is the first problem, and the second problem is how to uh, binarize the natural image in order to preserve the necessary information. So, the nature of data is binary, but the cameras do not work in binary mode. So, we have the, the color image as the input. So, the first step should be conversion to grayscale and then to the binary form. It can be done in various ways because we can apply uh, different color spaces, different, different methods of color to gray conversion uh, and various binarization algorithms. So I will present some illustrations about the influence of the color space and the color to grayscale and further binarization algorithm on the readability of such two-dimensional codes. Of course, if the images are poorly illuminated, if they contain some distortions, maybe geometrical, maybe related to contrast color, uh, if they are dirty, the dirt could not necessarily be black in the color image, but if the, the, if the dirt is also dark, it could be black after the binarization, so the recognition could be at least troublesome. So, in such a case, uh, if we have a natural image, especially captured somewhere outside in open air conditions with unknown lighting conditions, we could have a problem. Uh, and remembering that the quick response should be quick. Sometimes we just have no time. If you have installed on your mobile phone the QR reader or some similar applications, sometimes you just use the phone, try to scan and, and just try. It doesn't work always. Yeah, sometimes it just doesn't work. Uh, the reason is uh, the illumination. For example, imagine the QR code printed on the glass. It's extremely hard to recognize for such devices, yeah? Uh, because uh, the glass is transparent and the proper recognition depends on what is behind the glass, yeah? So, <coughs> we have proposed uh, the application of fast image binarization applying the statistical sampling, statistical experiment. To be honest, it's the Monte Carlo based method. For color images, we apply the various color spaces, various histogram based uh, binarization algorithms with uh, the use of such acceleration in order to verify um, the influence of the color model, influence the, of the binarization and the results are quite interesting, I, as I think. Uh, in order to ver verify uh, the usefulness and the validity of the proposed uh, method, uh, we used MATLAB environment as usually, uh, but we 
and have installed this ZBar binary called reader. It's cross cross platform freeware uh, solution uh, which can be called from MATLAB, for example. Uh, and we conducted some experiments for uh, various images, uh, natural images. Uh, so if we tried to recognize the codes directly without any preprocessing, without, without binarization, just from color images, it not always led to success. Uh, in many situations we have obtained in some preliminary experiments much better results, much better recognition accuracy uh, after changing the color model, after the conversion <coughs> to grayscale and after the further binarization. So the first conclusion is that the input image should be binary. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> so which color model should be used? We'll see. Uh, and we should also remember about the computational complexity. As I can say for the fourth time, quick response should be quick. So if we have a fast conversion method from RGB to any other color space, if it's just a linear conversion, uh, like in television, for example, and uh, YUV color model, for example, okay, it's fast. But if we convert uh, the color image into the grayscale using some more sophisticated algorithms or using nonlinear conversion of color spaces, for example, as in LIB color model, it's more time consuming. So maybe it could be better to try to make a fast conversion, try to recognize the code. If it doesn't go to success, then we use some slower methods, yeah? So, even if the conversion is quite slow, we can accelerate the next step of binarization. Our idea is to, to reduce the complexity of the binarization part of the application using the Monte Carlo method, because we can save a lot of time, uh, especially for high resolution images where the code is relatively small, but we have to process the, the whole image before the localization of the code. The localization is a separate problem. We haven't discussed uh, it exactly in the paper. So what is the idea? Uh, we, draw some, we draw a number of pixels. Uh, sorry for formatting, I don't know why. Uh, but we mm, draw a number of pixels relatively small. So if we have a 10 megapixels image, we draw just 100 pixels, maybe maybe 200, maybe 50 pixels. Uh, we generate them randomly. It is important that such uh, samples should be equally distributed in the whole image. Yeah? So if we use uh, the random number generator, generator with uniform distribution uh, applying for the two-dimensional image, uh, we can estimate the histogram, but not for the whole image, processing 10 megapixels, yeah? but only for drawn 100 or 200 pixels. We estimate the histogram remembering that binarization, histogram-based binarization methods use the histogram only uh, for uh, determining the threshold. So if we determine the threshold <coughs> basing on the simplified histogram representation, we obtain very, very similar result, but much faster. I will show you some uh, examples. Uh, so we just draw a limited number of samples from the whole distributed from the whole image and analyze the histogram of them. So then such simplified histogram can be the input data for OTS or CAP or ROSIN algorithms, all 
histogram based uh, very popular binarization methods. So we save a lot of time because we do not have to count all the pixels which belong to each luminance level. We just count the drawn pixels. Very, very strongly limited number of them. So if we verify such influence of color space, sometimes it's hard to find the color code, for example, but they are available. If we search on the internet, we can, um, we can find very surprising images of QR codes, uh, which are sometimes quite hard to recognize, but it's possible to recognize them. So if we applied the Monte Carlo method for such different resolution, uh, images, we can draw even 20 pixels and obtain a good result. So, those are the exemplary images here. Yeah? Totally different. Sometimes color, they are all natural images just captured by the video camera, publicly available. So, uh, sometimes we have the problem because uh, the QR code could be partially occluded. Sometimes uh, it could be hard because uh, the neighborhood of the QR code has the influ influence on the binarization. Sometimes it's not equally uh, illuminated. So trying to binarize the image as a whole and try to recognize the code without the localization because the localization of the co uh, QR code directly on the color image is not necessarily fast. Yeah? If you have an ap application in the mobile phone, you can try to fill the area with the code in order to simplify the recognition. Yeah? So, if we take just a re red channel from the image, we are unable to see any code because it was red. Yeah. Uh, if we take the same image, but the green color, uh, green channel, okay, everything seems to look good. Example of blue, but example of X in X Y Z, the code looks dirty. We would be unable to recognize it properly. Yeah. In some other color spaces, if we use the value, just the <coughs> brightness information from HSV color model, we lose the color. If we use Y, for example, for this image, those are only examples, yeah? Uh, we can lose the part of information, yeah? So we should be, uh, we should take care about, uh, about uh, the proper color model, yeah? Uh, those are the results <coughs> of uh, binarization using Otsu method with for, for limited number of samples using the Monte Carlo method for threshold estimation. And the results are also different because for different number of samples, quite low, depending on the color space which is used for color to grayscale conversion before the binarization, we obtain <coughs> uh, different results. Yeah? Those images are different. Maybe they would be recognized, maybe not. Those images of the same image yeah, are totally uh, dirty for recognizing. Yes, so we have very different, uh, very different situations uh, well, sometimes using only 20, pic 20 samples, we obtain much better results than using 1,000 samples, yeah? So, the number of samples could be low. Okay, so trying to recognize, for, for example, images, natural, of course, uh, 256 levels of gray. This image couldn't be properly recognized by the ZBAR software in any color space. We have 
all the minuses there. So such an image cannot be properly recognized in the grayscale or in the any of color channels. If we obtain, if we conduct the binarization, it leads to success. So we can apply the Otsu or Kapur method for full image. Using the Otsu method, success is almost everywhere. For Kapur method, uh, not always. For six channels, okay, properly recognized code. For four of them, no. But applying the Monte Carlo method for different number of samples, we can observe, for example, <coughs> Otsu method for 200 <coughs> of samples. Success is always even for Z. Okay, not always. It depends on sampling. Depends on, it's random. But even if it's random, if it's fast, we can try to determine five different thresholds using five experiments. We have a lot of time. It's very fast. So we can try to recognize the five images in parallel. If it's fast, okay, one of them will be okay. We know that if we have the text data, it's okay. If we do not have the text data after the, after the decoding of the QR code, okay, we fail it. But we know if we have success or not. So even if we conduct the recognition five times, one success is enough. We know which one is it, yeah? So, for another image, the red one, yeah? Well, success in blue and Z channels, they are similar to each other. Uh, after the binarization for some of the channels, yeah? But quite similar results, sometimes even in some other color spaces, can be obtained mm, for some other color spaces, yeah, which are useless for full image binarization. Another idea, quick response code, uh, successes for grayscale, some successes for Monte Carlo method. It was quite hard because a lot of Neighboring pixels are very similar, so if we draw such dark pixels, they uh, will influence the threshold. So, sometimes, for the blue channel, using Otsu, uh, fast binarization, we can also recognize the code. And another quite uh, strange image, without the margins. It's wrong, it's very hard for uh, for the recognition. Uh, we also have some successes for uh, the color channels, binarized. Uh, for such um, color channels uh, which haven't led to the success for grayscale or full image binarization. So, well, we verified that uh, there is a strong influence of the color model on the recognition accuracy of the QR codes, uh, but we, ha we also verified the usefulness of the fast uh, binarization in various color spaces. Of course, uh, the number of randomly chosen pixels can be reduced dramatically, uh, but even if we do not obtain the result, we can repeat the procedure and draw once again. Uh, it's just the cost of the randomness. Uh, okay, so one additional remark. For such an image, it's very, very hard for recognition. Uh, but sometimes, 
if we apply block-based binarization, so the binarization using the Monte Carlo also method, yeah, if it would be more local, sometimes, depending on draws, we can obtain something like this. So the binarization thresholds would be different, so part of the image could be treated as negative in the sense of background, yeah? If for some parts, we have four blocks there, yeah? So if for some parts of the image, uh, the background will be white, and for some other black, we can treat it as the margins, so due to simplified localization of the code, the recognition of such a code is possible. But there are no chances to recognize this one, although it uh, looks quite good yeah, for us, but not for the algorithm. So, um, to conclude, of course, we know that the results are dependent on the number of samples. Uh, sometimes it would be necessary to uh, make the repetition of drawing, but the proof of method is fast. Uh, we can binarize the images very fast. Uh, even for high resolution of the image, especially a natural image acquired uh, in different lighting conditions, we can check several possible color representations and try to uh, make a fast conversion, try to binarize and recognize the code. If it, there will be no success, we can repeat the procedure for the other color space. Of course, remembering that the available hardware now or in a few years mm, will uh, mm, give us a chance of parallel processing, we can make a parallel implementation of uh, the method, converting the image into par in parallel into, for example, four different color spaces, conduct four binarization, and if we obtain four results of decoding in parallel, one of them is enough. If we have a success with the Ritz Solomon code, it's enough. Yeah? We only need to find a single color space and a single binarization method uh, which will allow the proper <coughs> recognition for us. Okay, thank you for your attention. Feel free thank to you. ask thank questions. You. Any question? Uh, I ask. I wonder which method did you use for PCD random number generator? It's just MATLAB's built-in generator. MATLAB's function? Yeah, Mat it's MATLAB function with uniform distribution. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to do uh, localization prior to binarization or to do binarization then localization and when picture is localized then to do uh, yeah. a better binarization? Localization is another problem, but uh, yeah, there are some attempts, there are some different methods. If we try to localize the uh, QR code on, to, on the color image, uh, we can use, for example, the color histograms, and we should analyze the variance, and if we find the place, where the distribution of colors is two model, B model, yeah? We have only black and white, so high variance. Uh, there is a possible QR code, but uh, it's before the binarization, yeah? But it's quite time consuming because we should uh, analyze the local histograms, yeah? Of course, we could try to estimate the histograms using the Monte Carlo method. Yeah, we could try, but it, it's not as easy as for binarization because 
if we have a limited number of samples, uh, we have very limited information. So histogram doesn't look the same. Uh, maybe it could be useful, but the threshold <coughs> is very similar, yeah? But only the threshold, yeah? Uh, but uh, if we try to analyze the variance, for example, it could be quite different, yeah? So uh, it is possible, but time consuming. So after the binarization, it's much easier, yeah? It's much faster, yeah? Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Okarma. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The second presentation title is uh, Laser Scanner Calibration Dependency. Mr. Mulder from Estonia. I'm from Tallinn University of Technology and I'm going to talk about laser scanner calibration dependency on the laser line detection method. Uh, I will start with an introduction, uh, then I will continue with the basics of the laser scanner and why the calibration is needed. Um, then how we determine the laser light plane parameters with pixel and sub-pixel laser line detection methods and then some results and conclusions. Uh, in 3D laser scanners, uh, calibration is needed in order to convert the pixels in camera to real-world units. And this is done using simple triangular transform and, uh, but uh, also uh, during the calibration process, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, distortions are corrected. Uh, uh, distortions caused by the lens optics, <coughs> but uh, also uh, distortions that actually the laser lines are actually rarely straight. Uh, this is also caused by the optics uh, used in front of the laser beam. Uh, Many uh, 3D laser scanner calibration methods exist, but uh, all of those methods use uh, laser line detection as part of the calibration process. And therefore, calibration accuracy is uh, directly dependent on the uh, laser line detection method and the resolution of the <coughs> laser line detection method. Uh, by knowing that uh, laser light uh, forms a proper laser light uh, plane uh, and the laser line is located on the on this laser light plane we can find the laser line position in the camera coordinate system uh, from this we can calculate the real position of the laser line in in real world units uh, in order to find the laser light plane parameters, we have used a uh, uh, method where we used uh, uh, chess ports and we used uh, different poses of the chess ports. And by knowing the camera intrinsic parameters uh, and uh, the chess port size, uh, we can calculate the extrinsic parameters of the chess port, uh, which are the rotation <coughs> and uh, translation vectors of the chess box <coughs> and we know that these laser lines are located on these chess boards so uh, we can uh, calculate the uh, uh, real locations of these uh, laser lines on those chess boards uh, in order to see how the uh, laser line detection uh, method or the resolution of the laser line detection method influences the <coughs> end results. Uh, we have uh, found these uh, laser lines with two methods. First with pixel resolution method from the chessboard and also with a sub-pixel resolution. 
For the pixel resolution method, we used uh, 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 Gaussian distribution convolution, and uh, and also for the for the subpixel resolution, we used also the Gaussian convolution, but uh, we improved it with a uh, parable, uh, finding the more accurate uh, location of the convolution uh, top. So. Uh, in the calibration process, uh, we have found with the two methods of these uh, laser light plane parameters. Uh, here you can see the results that we gained with uh, different image sets. Uh, this is with a pixel resolution laser line detection method and also the uh, subpixel resolution laser line detection method. Uh, the changes of the parameters are quite small. But the biggest, uh, biggest uh, variation is the parameter A, uh, which is actually the rotation uh, of the laser light plane. And in order to see how the actual measurement results are influenced by the laser line detection resolution in the calibration process, uh, we use two objects to measure the uh, actual measurements. Uh, here is an example of the input image that we used. It's taken from around two meter height. Uh, there are two objects. One is six mi millimeters in height, and the other one is 25 millimeters in height. And here is a bigger image uh, uh, of these objects uh, uh, zoomed in. And uh, from the measurement image, the laser line is uh, detected with subpixel resolution. So the only uh, the time uh, when the uh, method is changed is in the calibration process. Uh, here is the results that we get with both methods. As you can see, the uh, object's uh, heights are quite uh, accurate, but there is some deviation between the subpixel resolution and the pixel resolution image. And from this image, you can see it more clearly. It's a smaller object, and you can see that there is a deviation between these uh, measurement results with pixel and subpixel resolution. Uh, we found out that uh, the, the difference uh, between the measurements is quite systematic with different image sets, uh, and uh, it was minus one to 1.2 millimeters deviation across the whole laser line image in our current experiments. This is uh, quite a big uh, deviation if we are talking about uh, sub-millimeter measurements. And uh, then we uh, uh, calculated the real uh, height of the objects. Uh, and the standard deviation of the of the measurements, and uh, of course we saw that uh, the the results with uh, pixel uh, subpixel uh, resolution in the calibration process gave us more accurate results, but uh, it's a matter of trade-off between the complexity of the laser line uh, detection method and the uh, accuracy of the of the system because in uh, in embedded systems the uh, processor resources are quite limited and uh, maybe it's not worth to uh, to uh, develop such a complicated laser line detection system in order to calibrate the system accurately. Uh, so for the conclusion we have investigated how the calibration uh, uh, measurement uh, results are dependent of the laser line detection method with pixel and subpixel resolution. And uh, we saw that there was quite a uh, big uh, influence. Uh, we compared the measurement results with uh, reference objects. And uh, the deviation was uh, around one was one to plus 1.2 millimeters in our setup. Standard deviation of the measurements was less than 0 0.5 millimeters. And uh, we found out that actually the subpixel laser line detection method improves the measurement results. But again, uh, if the measurement accuracy is not so important, let's say within a few millimeters, 
then uh, the pixel resolution laser line detection method is okay as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? No question. I have one. Could you show once again the photo of two objects? Yeah. For a moment. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the camera is located not, uh, probably not exactly at the top. Yeah, so the objects are probably not exactly uh, at the bottom in the same place as, as the camera, yeah? Yes. In my opinion, it's, this is the reason of your uh, uh, the, the systematic error, because uh, if you have the object which is located not in the central part, not in the optical axis of the camera, uh, the difference between the lines you can observe changes, yeah? So if the object is shifted, you will have the systematic change of the line, yeah? So you will observe the different height, yeah? In my opinion, it could influence your results, yeah? Not the change between two methods, yeah? But the shift. That's why you observe 5.5 centimeters, not 6, for example, yeah? Uh, Actually, the uh, uh, these uh, la laser plane parameters can are uh, how to say uh, uh, found in the calibration process, and uh, the angle of the laser is uh, is uh, uh, in in such a case irrelevant of the of the uh, of the measurement results. If the uh, plane parameters are found correctly, then it doesn't matter in which area the the laser line is located. I am work uh, under implementation of uh, lattice leader uh, neural networks uh, on FPGA and here I present only part of my work. Uh, so I present the uh, aim and task of my work. Uh, a structure of uh, lattice leader neuron, the so the motivation is uh, such that uh, the precise implementation of the nonlinearity and the FPGA gives cause uh, for concern. The FPGA is suitable for the uh, implementation of uh, and uh, make some calcula uh, calculation uh, with uh, integer numbers, uh, but not well suitable for numbers uh, for floating point numbers. <coughs> so the accuracy of activation function. possible uh, uh, nonlinear function implementation. It is uh, straightforward or cordic uh, recursive algorithm. Uh, it uh, consume uh, 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 much uh, the arithmetic resources of FPGA and increase the latency. The second group is the piecewise linear or piecewise quadratic approximation. Uh, it is not accurate uh, 
also requires the arithmetic resources and memory. Uh, uh, we can synthesize the nonlinear function also in the logic, but it requires uh, much more the logic resources and uh, uh, is not so accurate. <coughs> and we decide uh, to use uh, the dedicated uh, block random access memory to store the uh, lookup table of the nonlinear function. Uh, and the aim uh, is to determine uh, how much the uh, memory resources uh, we require for the output signal uh, depending on the output gain and memory size. So here is our object, here is uh, only single uh, lattice leader neuron uh, uh, with second order lattice and lattice and leader part here we uh, have gain and uh, our uh, activation function uh, so we store only the uh, nonlinear part in our uh, lookup table here is uh, uh, just uh, we put through the input value to the output because uh, here's the same values and here is constantly one so we must uh, to a little bit uh, change the uh, nonlinear hyperbolic tangent function to increase uh, uh, two point uh, zero three coefficient uh, to make to make this point connection in this point uh, more smoothly. So to evaluate the uh, accuracy, we used a uh, very well known uh, two parameters. There is average error and maximum error. Uh, they are calculated uh, as uniform sampling the input signal on a million equally spaced points in range from minus one to one and uh, the third parameter is the uh, root mean square error of the transfer function uh, we put the input signal chirp input signal uh, to the input of our neuron and measure the transfer function of on the output so Here's our uh, output uh, error. The surface of output error, which depends on uh, uh, dedicated memory size in kilo kilobytes, and uh, here is the gain. And after the experimentation, we de decide to use uh, two kilobytes to store the hyperbolic tangent nonlinear function, and the maximum error is uh, less than uh, 0.4 percent uh, and we work actually at at this point where it's two kilobytes the second uh, experimentation uh, was with uh, the transfer function here's the root mean square error and uh, we set the uh, neuron to work uh, in narrow as narrow band filter, as uh, half band filter, and as uh, uh, full band uh, uh, filter, and here's the surfaces of uh, error in logarithmic scale. So here we see uh, the error of transfer function with maximum gain of 16 here here and here for full band half band and narrow band and uh, there is this line for full band second line for half band and uh, for narrow band this line so uh, we can see that 
the narrower the uh, baseband is, uh, the the higher uh, the error of the of the transfer function on the output. Uh, so, to first uh, conclusion I have mentioned that we decided to use two kilobytes uh, of memory, achieving uh, 0 0.4 or less uh, the maximum error. And the uh, third uh, conclusions after the implementation uh, of the uh, lattice leader neuron with the activation function, we achieved the maximum frequency of 312 megahertz, which is uh, mm, actually a high frequency for the FPGA. Uh, so, thank you for attention. <laughs> Any questions? Did I miss the uh, number of bits you used for one output sample? I was saying uh, uh -huh, okay. the total memory. Yes, we use two bytes for one sample, uh, 60 bits. And um, did you consider like a variation because uh, if you maybe increase number of bits then you could decrease uh, total memory? It's yes, it, it's, uh, it's possible but it's actually trade-off of memory and, uh, and accuracy. It's in, uh, uh, in the uh, low memory FPGA, we have only a few kilobytes of memory, so we we just uh, uh, if we decide to use a uh, more precise, uh, uh, more than sixteen of the thirty-two bits, then we must decrease the number of the, the samples. Any question? Thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. The uh, title of my presentation is on the water broadband acoustic scattering modeling based on FTDT. This is joint uh, research collaboration between University of Pretoria in South Africa and Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics in China. Actually, first author is supposed to be here and present the uh, paper as it is in the program, but um, they leave the responsibility to me, so I will do try my best to present the paper. Outline of presentation is introduction and motivation of this research, FTTD methodology, boundary condition, uh, improved method, which is our proposal, simulation result, and analysis, and we, at the end, we conclude the presentation. As introduction, um, FTTD, or finite difference time domain, was first proposed uh, by uh, Yi in 1966, and it used in uh, electromagnetic field. In 1995, there was uh, application of FTTT uh, in room acoustic problems, and after that, we had uh, some progress in uh, to solving this FTTT room acoustic problem in some fields like computational speed, like boundary condition, or uh, near to uh, to far uh, field transformation. In 1996, there was the first proposal uh, regarding application of FTTT uh, in uh, underwater uh, acoustic problems. And after that, we had uh, some proposals, some research works uh, regarding FTTT only to solve the sound wave propagation in shallow water, not the deep water. So what is this advantage of the uh, uh, recent work? The first one is they consider only 2D objects. So they didn't consider like complex objects, uh, like 3D objects. The second one is uh, they didn't consider uh, absorbing uh, uh, boundary condition, which may affect large reflection as well. And uh, as you can see, the, 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 the third one is um, about they use single frequency signal as incident wave which they consider for analysis, they consider time and space, but not frequency characteristic. So what we are trying to do in our proposal, we're trying to consider time and space and also adding this frequency uh, characteristic to our model. Uh, considering sound wave propagation in underwater, um, the formula of FTDT consists of Euler equation and the equation of continuity. As you can see here, we try to divide uh, computational domain to several degrees, 
and uh, what, what we can call is the three uh, dimensional grid geometry by uh, FTDT formula. For example, we have in x direction y and z, which is a space, and uh, this is the classical FTDT methodology. The all the formula they consider time and also the space in x, y, and z the direction. And in this classical FTDT, time uh, must be uh, small enough, as you can see here, to keep uh, stability of the uh, algorithm. Uh, the key to solve acoustic problem with FTTT is to have appropriate boundary model. Uh, if if you, we don't have the uh, like uh, bounded domain and we, if we have unbounded domain, uh, what we must first do is to find appropriate uh, ABC or absorbing boundary condition uh, uh, to terminate the computational domain. Otherwise, this computational domain will act as a reflector, uh, which is not a favorite. So uh, to, to find uh, about the boundary model, we have two models currently, for example, impedance uh, boundary model, which is not target of this research and topic of this research. And the second one is uh, absorbing boundary model. Uh, this absorbing boundary model consists of two other models, subcategories like MURABC and PMLABC. In the first one, MUR, the fact is uh, we have limited reflection in a specific frequency and angle. But in the second one, uh, which we use in our proposal, uh, we, we see this one in our simulation analysis as, as well. Uh, we have fully, uh, 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 completely absorption, uh, regardless of any frequency and regardless of any uh, specific angles. Uh, as we discussed, and also is in title of this research, the source wave uh, or incidence wave is void band, is broad band. So, uh, what we expect, uh, this uh, will surround all the computational domain. And also we can divide the computational domain to several areas, like PML region, which we can also call this one PML buffer. We see the formula of this side in the next slide, and also the interior side. So this is the formula we have for PML uh, buffer, and all in all this formula, we have some uh, coefficient like alpha x, alpha y, and alpha z, uh, which can be called as attenuation coefficient. We use this attenuation co coefficient to uh, modify our proposal. So all the equations that we discussed so far, they are uh, mainly uh, appropriate for homogeneous, non-dissipative uh, medium. But in actual and real environment, what we need, th th there are many factors that may affect the sound wave propagation. Uh, for example, when we talk about uh, sound propagation in the sea, the absorption sound mainly depends on uh, the, some mechanism like uh, viscous absorption and molecular thermal uh, relaxation absorption. The fact is, uh, for absorption loss, uh, it mainly depends on the frequency. As you can see, this is the absorption coefficient, which depends on the frequency, and, and this is the formula that we use to modify the, uh, uh, the classical FTDT. And also, the other, on the other side, attenuation coefficient also uh, is, can be expressed as a formula of uh, power law. And here, what we have is this delta R is a transmission distance, which we can show this transmission distance as a function of time and also a speed. Uh, this is the modified FTDT uh, that we use in our um, the research work. We consider here time. We also consider this beta that we previously showed that is function of the frequency. Uh, to, 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 have, uh, uh, to divide the computational modeling, we try to use a mesh generated. And we also use computer graphic to generate the mesh, uh, um, uh, mesh generating of the FTDT method. So um, this is an example how we can, for example, to divide this uh, the model and also the computational uh, the, the, uh, what, uh, the domain that we have. Uh, what we can do is uh, we must have, uh, this is the tetrahedron that we have. We must have finite number of these tetrahedron. Uh, each tetrahedron must have three vertices like A, B, C, uh, and uh, like vertice one, vertice two, and vertice three, which can consist of three, three vertices of the triangle. And also D, another vertice that we can uh, consider this one as center of the model. This P is, uh, can be uh, any point uh, in, this, uh, in the area. 
So and uh, we have now uh, four vertices. And if we uh, want to analyze this one, if we consider vertices one, two, and three equal to zero, greater than zero, and only the, the fourth one, which is this one, center of the model, greater than zero, then we can conclude that P is inside the target model. And uh, the same condition, but if we consider V4, uh, which is again this uh, D center, as a zero, then we can consider that P is inside the surface. And all, if all these uh, vertices are equal to zero, we can say that uh, this tetrahedron is not the target, and we must compare the model with another tetrahedron. Uh, simulation analysis, this is the simulation parameters that we use, for example, sound uh, speed in the water and also water density. Uh, what we have here is, we first we want to uh, justify our approach based on two boundary conditions, which can be, um, the first one is based on PML uh, boundary condition, and the second one is based on MUR. In open model, which is this one, uh, sound will come, hit the object, and also penetrate, and then propagate. But based on the second boundary, uh, boundary condition that is MUR, we see that we don't have penetration, but, uh, and also the, uh, this sound wave doesn't um, hit the object. So we are trying to justify, and based on this uh, uh, result, we can see that um, our boundary condition that uh, wor is work uh, appropriately. And also, uh, if we consider uh, incident spectrum and scatter um, uh, spectrum, we see that we have some uh, new uh, frequency component, um, which can be based on uh, dispersion of sound uh, propagation. The incident rate that we use is the uh, LFM, uh, linear frequency modulation. The formula is here. This LFM uh, is uh, strong enough um, to interference, multipass, and Doppler shift. That's why we use this uh, LFM as incidence wave. For 2D objects, uh, this is um, black and white we can consider as uh, incident wave. And there are some uh, area gray here. Mm. We can consider sound pressure intensity. If we continue the analysis, we see that uh, the, the original object was only consists of one circuit here. But after uh, sound wave come and heat and pro, uh, penetrate into the object, we see now we have uh, more than one circuit. Uh, like for example, here is one, the another one is this side. And here you see there is one circuit and another circuit. So the reason is, um, we have more circuits because of incidence wave are disappearing. It's like v drum and sound wave is also disappearing uh, after a while. For complex objects, which is 3D object, uh, this is uh, the irregular or complex object that we have. And we try to um, convert this one to based on the mesh generated method that we already discussed. And the incidence wave is in x or uh, y uh, plane. Um, if you want to consider um, the result in x of y and x of z, you see that the object that we considered in the previous slide now is uh, symmetric here. The shadow is symmetric here, but it's not symmetric in x or z. Um, and also, the, another analysis we see that if we <laughs> consider distribution of sound pressure, uh, that large area we cannot see uh, when we consider x or y, but it's up here. here. Uh, when we, uh, we consider um, X or Z plane. And the last uh, analysis that we have is based on waveform that we can conclude the waveform can show us the shape of the object. We can derive the shape of the object based on the waveform that we have. And also we can see that they are symmetric uh, based on wave reaching time, which is like four milliseconds uh, here and four milliseconds in this area. But it's this, in this uh, analysis, that the simulation is that we got is asymmetric. The starting, uh, the reach time is like 1.6 millisecond. So as a conclusion, we try to modify this FTDT uh, methodology. And also, uh, we use absorption coefficient, which is frequency uh, dependence, to compute broadband acoustic scattering model <coughs> for under, uh, underwater complex objects. And for the simulation result, 
we got very close to what we can see in the real environment and uh, with high accuracy as well. So for future, when we try to develop the algorithm uh, for uh, calculating the computational of broadband acoustic scattering model in underwater. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. If there is any question, please. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so, what is exactly the problem with deep water? Why is this only for shallow water? No, this is not for the shallow water. This is for the real water. Yeah, this is in the real condition that we use for the submarine. So the proposal actually is approved by uh, submarine department in China and submarine department in South Africa. So this is the real research work, but the previous work is only for the shallow water, like in the river, something like that, for a small object. Thank you. Thank you. Right. The last presentation title is Source Traffic Modeling in WSN for Acoustic Sensing in Reverberant Environment. Mr. Seti from Serbia. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nena Cetic. Uh, I'm coming from Serbia, from uh, University of Novi Sad, Faculty of Technical Sciences. And I will present you a paper about uh, source traffic modeling in viral sensor network for acoustical sensing in this reverberant environments or this uh, enclosures with the uh, reverberation. So the main motivation behind this uh, research is the, this um, uh, modern consumer electronics uh, environment where we want to put a bunch of sensors in the room and try to uh, make uh, intelligibility about the environment and about the, uh, to provide an extra feature, so to provide a, a smart uh, kind of place for living. Uh, these embedded res uh, uh, devices are usually coming with uh, low resources, so uh, this is a, 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 a sort of a sensor that is connected to a to a, um, some processing unit, and we are advocating here that that this uh, sensors could be uh, connected to a conventional internet network, uh, and we are trying to to uh, make a contribution in, in research in this area. Uh, acoustical sensing is traditionally done with this microphone arrays, which are good for uh, defining the, the, the uh, sources of localization of, of the sound using uh, 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 ray forming and, and uh, better technologies, of course, microphone grids where you have a, a 2D sets of uh, things, but uh, when you want to really do a, a, a better way of, of things, you we think that uh, these sensors should be wirelessly uh, connected so that you can place them uh, in your environment without any uh, boundaries. Uh, problem with the conventional internet network is this best effort service that did not guaranteeing uh, any quality uh, of service in respect of, of uh, uh, transform, especially with the wireless uh, communication. So we are trying to make a contribution on how to actually analyze this uh, using simulation. What we consider here is a RTP protocol, real-time protocol for uh, transferring the data. And uh, in a combination with this uh, IEEE uh, 1588, uh, it could be used to uh, temporarily synchronize uh, uh, sensors so that you can have a, a good temporary resolution uh, and correlation between sensors. Uh, a lot of uh, work is, is currently done with this uh, IoT, which is uh, Internet of Things, and it's sort of a vibrant uh, researching scene which uh, has a lot of researchers and contributors. Also, uh, we're uh, having uh, uh, in mind that uh, cloud computing can 
do uh, here. So uh, that's why we are trying to stream uh, audio from uh, sensors to some processing unit, which can be really dislocated or even in the cloud. Uh, so we are trying to to uh, make a contribution to that, and and this is a mainly the the need for this additional research. So our idea is to try to uh, make a new traffic model. So this is uh, going to be a new uh, source traffic model, to be more precise. Uh, and we have a, a focus in the event environment, uh, <coughs> such as small room and, and, and enclosures that are uh, applicable to a, you know, sort of a living space. Uh, we will uh, use a, a image source model, we will see what it, that is in a minute, for the sound propagation modeling. And uh, we are analyzing uh, properties of, of, of the VSM before this is applied. So this is only a MATLAB simulation, uh, but we will see how we actually verify this with a, with a real uh, room in a, in a real uh, scenario. So basically the, the presentation overview will give us uh, a little bit about acoustical sensing. Uh, we are, we'll discuss the sound propagation problem and, and uh, this, uh, giving a, a little bit of a image source modeling calculus. Uh, then we are uh, presenting our uh, sensor model. So we have a, a little bit of, a, of a research and an idea on how to do these sensors uh, in software and uh, uh, we will discuss experimental results and, and glance about over the related work that is done on this subject and finally conclude and give uh, some general remarks. Uh, acoustic sensing uh, is uh, in constant contrast with a different sensing. Uh, it's usually a non line of sight type of a sensing, so it, it is enough for you to have a one sensor in, in the room and you can even sense something behind a pole or, or behind a corner because of the sound propagation. So it's, it is really convenient uh, for a lot of application and, and, and multiple uh, purpose sensing could be done with, with such a thing, but this multi-purpose is, is, is where we see the majority of problem because uh, processing and heavy processing cannot be really done in place in, in, in your uh, sensor uh, because it could be uh, uh, time and, and energy consuming. So uh, we are advocating this, this approach where the, the sound is actually transferred to a, a bigger unit and then process either trying to be processed in real time or on doing offline analysis. So uh, this is also connected with this uh, wireless uh, multimedia sensor networks. So these are uh, sensor networks that are trying to transfer video or audio. Uh, but also acoustic sensing is, is uh, stuff that is usually uh, having all sorts of applications like uh, hearing aids uh, can be a wireless sensor network. Basically your two uh, uh, hearing aids could transfer it uh, uh, sound between them and, and try to enhance uh, your so sound experience. Also hands-free telephony, the, the stuff that you do with the sensors on your desk and trying to make a conference room, things like this, with the, uh, that are just sitting there in a table and picking the, the, the voice. Uh, a lot of uh, possibility to do acoustic monitoring, surveillance, uh, environment, uh, uh, assessment or, or the classification, uh, for instance, uh, where you apply this to outdoors and uh, there are uh, certain projects dealing with, with the classification of, of uh, 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 different vehicles you know, on a highway and stuff like that. Also, when you try to do a presence detection, you can apply it to a uh, modern smart house and, and, uh, and uh, smart grid so to uh, make a better energy efficiency uh, and a lot of, uh, of this could be in integrated with a, with, a, with a extra artificial intelligence and to make this ambient intelligence. 
So sound and acoustic sensing can help with that. Uh, of course, distributed sensors are better than, than the grids or arrays mm -hmm. because they are uh, specially uh, distributed so you can have an extra information, but you actually need to know where uh, each of these sensors uh, is to actually use that information. For the sound propagation model, we use uh, image source model. This is a, an old technique uh, proposed by Alan and Barclay in 79. Uh, the basic idea is that you uh, model your enclosure and then uh, create an images of this enclosure indefinite in all uh, dimensions. This is 2D case, of course, but it can also be applied in, in 3D. Uh, so basically, this is our uh, source of the sound, and we are modeling it. Uh, we are modeling this wall with the sources or the reflected source here and here and here and here and etc. So basically, when you do uh, a modeling like this, you are multiplying the, the sources to uh, get a reflection or reverberation effect and you sum up everything in, in, a, in a point somewhere where your sensor is. So we'll, we'll see that in a minute. This technique is good for, and really simple for rectangular shapes and, and usual uh, living space. Uh, it is also possible to do with uh, uh, non-convex enclosure, but mathematics is uh, a little bit complex, like a room like this, <laughs> for instance. And, uh, the, in a recent work, this Eric uh, Lehman proposed a fast uh, image source model which we are using in, in this work and relying on some of the implementations also in MATLAB for uh, coming from Eric. So this is the image source model in calculus. We are using Cartesian coordinate system to describe where our sources and, and sensors are and we have a, a room dimension uh, uh, there in the vector. Uh, we are having this uh, triplet sums to, to actually uh, model our room uh, and, and uh, doing all the parameters in all the directions. So what, what is the main uh, 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 part of the, of the transfer function H here, which is a really uh, uh, impulse response from a room? It's the actual attenuation coming from the uh, enclosure and the delay of, of the sound propagation uh, with this uh, uh, delay that, that, is, this, that is defined uh, over here. So basically when we have uh, attenuation and delay for each of the images, then we sum all this up and, and uh, have our uh, transfer function. Uh, the actual attenuation uh, is modeled by this reflection and, and absorption coefficients, or uh, you actually define either alpha or beta, so that uh, you can do this, this transformation over here. Uh, what's the, uh, the catch is that this is, for instance, uh, your left wall, this is right wall, this is your back wall, this is uh, a front wall, and this is uh, ceiling and, and, and the floor. So you, you're modeling absorption of all the enclosures and you can have uh, even a homogeneous uh, uh, space uh, defined like this. Uh, we are then uh, defining this, this uh, distance between the source and, and, uh, and the actual sensor and, and using this diagonal matrix. And to be more efficient and, and to, to actually speed up our calculation, uh, not to do it in, in, in a time domain like this, we use actually a, a frequency domain, so a little bit of a modified uh, calculus to do um, a, a, a frequency domain uh, mm -hmm. room uh, impulse response. Uh, then, when we want to uh, do a simulation of this room with this uh, uh, ESM method, we are uh, applying a uh, source signal here and do an uh, uh, FFT of that and do a uh, uh, 
frequency domain convolution here, and then we have our uh, convoluted uh, 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 source uh, uh, of the sound. To get a, a real time domain, we just use a inverse uh, fast Fourier transformation to get the actual transform uh, signal or, or transform sound. Next is our sensor uh, model. So we are here proposing a little bit of a, a, a intelligence in the sensor, not to send data where there is no uh, acoustic event. So this is a simple acoustic sensor with a noise gate. And uh, this is uh, a definition of, of a sensor. Basically, we are uh, modeling our, our signals having the, the uh, single of interest plus some noise, either environmental noise or noise coming uh, from the actual imperfection of, of the sensor. So it, it could be that your microphone is, is uh, not really flat, so we're having the, the uh, consideration that these sensors sh should be uh, really uh, cost efficient, so you don't have to use uh, uh, really sophisticated uh, uh, microphones in the technology. And this algorithm is basically energy-based uh, operating on, on the blocks of, of samples so that we can have a, a really straightforward implementation and, and, and uh, use uh, uh, less uh, computational power. Uh, first, we are trying to estimate a noise floor or the environment in, in the actual sensor. And this is considered as a, as a sensor calibration. We are operating on uh, M uh, samples to do a uh, calibration. Uh, then we are trying to uh, do the, the, the same thing with, uh, with calculating this mean square value for the real signal uh, and uh, do a, sound, uh, uh, a signal to noise ratio or, or this uh, estimated signal energy to uh, background uh, signal energy and apply a simple algorithm like this where we compare the SNR to a SNR threshold and if we are above the threshold we are transmitting the data or uh, we have an identity function here but if our, we are below uh, the threshold, we just don't send the data, so, so we consider it's, it's complete silence. Uh, in effect, this is the example of what this uh, sensor will do. When we have a, a time domain in our, our, our uh, sound like this, uh, depending on, on the uh, energy of, of uh, the actual uh, sound wave, uh, you will have your silences and actual acoustical event uh, differences and uh, this is the line showing where the noise gate is open and when it's closed. When we look at, at, at this uh, other diagram, this is basically this, this staircase is where we produce data. So this is amount of data produced over time. So we just tried not to produce uh, any uh, traffic when, when there is no uh, acoustic uh, event. So, to first to validate our uh, uh, image source modeling, we had uh, uh, set up the virtual <laughs> room. So one of the imaginary room just uh, defined with a bunch of uh, coefficients. So we uh, put up uh, one uh, uh, source and uh, 3,020 sensors in the room, which is uh, not feasible at all, but in simulation we can do it so that we can have a nice uh, graph. And we are looking for the sound propagation or actually energy distribution through, through the room so that we can see whether the reverberation effect uh, is, is shown in, in our uh, simulation. Uh, important uh, parameter of this, uh, a part of the absorption coefficient, is this uh, decay time, which is basically uh, your reverberation time. Uh, 
T60 is, is a measurement when your signal is dropped by 60 decibels. It is possible also to use T20 or T30, depending on the, on the, on the uh, equipment that you have, so you can measure uh, dynamic range of, 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 the, of the sound. So uh, here are the results. When we uh, look at the non-echoic uh, room, so these absorbers co coefficients are, are uh, non-existing or, or our reverberation time is zero, we see the, the sound propagation, which is uh, kind of uh, worst of the square of the distance, and uh, we have no effect. So this is, this is just uh, if we are uh, uh, more, uh, uh, if distance between the, the, the actual source and the si signal is uh, greater, the, the signal will just be at, uh, attenuated and not distorted. Uh, then we are actually doing the simulation of the ESM in these three cases using three different uh, uh, inputs uh, in, in on the sound source. So we use here white nose to um, make sure that we have uh, all uh, uh, components in the spectrum. And you can see the reverberation effects of the, the actual noise floor uh, in the room is much higher than, than uh, in a not echoic case. Then the interesting results are when we try to uh, apply this with a, a simple sine wave <coughs> or a single sine wave. This is uh, 128 uh, hertz. You can see this harmonics, and these are basically where uh, you have uh, your uh, stationary uh, waves uh, either summing up or, or, or dividing itself or, or canceling it each other. So that you have these curves. And for the 1K uh, case, for the 1000 uh, hertz, uh, you can see the, the really uh, uh, a mess here so that your uh, sensor uh, placement in, in the room is really important and especially when you look in the spectrum uh, where to put your sensor depending on the application what you want to to sense for and uh, actual monitoring of the of the room so and this is the the main idea uh, of the work to actually do a simulation before you actually place your sensors so that you can know where to, uh, where to uh, put and what kind of a results you want, you want to expect. Then we're trying to do uh, more of the validation with trying to uh, uh, simulate uh, a real room. This is one of the room in the faculty uh, with uh, dimensions and, and, uh, and one source and one sensor. And then we're trying to, uh, to measure how much traffic we are generating with this sensor, uh, having these uh, parameters in, in um, mind. So this calibration time is, is 5,000, but it could be uh, uh, even longer if we just want to do that. For the purposes of simulation, we're just limiting it like this. And uh, what we are actually doing in this experiment, we are making variances of, of the estimation block, which is the basically our uh, size of our packets that we are sending uh, in the RTP packet. RTP packet is uh, having the, the fixed uh, header size, which is just 40 octets uh, like this. And the, for the all uh, sources that we use or the signal that we use for the processing, we are uh, hand annotating what is the actual uh, sound uh, event and where, what is the silence. So this uh, lambda uh, coefficients is uh, signal uh, duration coefficient, uh, so basically uh, ratio between uh, uh, periods of sounds and periods of silence, so that we can uh, evaluate uh, the performance or, or, or from our noise gate comparing in, into this curve. So in a uh, theoretical sense, this is uh, going to be our uh, average data rate. 
So we set the maximum average data rate, which will be this naive case where we send the old data. So everything that is, uh, that is done here is just sensor constantly uh, sampling and sending data. You can see that for the smaller uh, packets, uh, there is this overhead uh, with, with a header, of course, so you, you uh, spend more bandwidth for that. And, and uh, you get it even out when, when the actual packets are uh, bigger. The, when you multiply this with our lambda factor, you will get the, the bottom line here, which is basically our uh, uh, ideal case where we have a noise gate on, on the sample level and we uh, put out only a significant data and not, uh, not a background noise. Uh, then we try to apply our uh, sensor algorithm without reverberation effect and we get these results. So uh, this is uh, due to uh, sampling over the blocks. So blocks are uh, just shifted in time and, and uh, misalignment between sound uh, or this acoustic event and our block will produce extra data so we are we are gathering the, the little bit of a noise uh, on, on the edges of the block so this is why this curve is a little bit uh, uh, different than the actual actual theoretical minimum and then we are trying to do uh, noise gate with uh, ESM and noise gate with the uh, uh, real signal uh, captured in the room and we can see that we are pretty much close the differences are that, that we have not spent too much time on, on, on setting the proper absorption coefficients and, and, and uh, this decay time so we want ju just roughly to see whether this could be used for calculating the average data rates and, and uh, the correlation between these uh, two curves is, is pretty much obvious. So, uh, what is done with, with uh, related work in, in this area, there are a lot of uh, acoustic sensing uh, um, using the wireless sensor network for environment, for tracking animals, for uh, doing a lot of different stuff. Uh, but a source traffic modeling of this kind to the best of our knowledge was non-existing. So uh, nobody uh, got uh, to this point to, to create a source traffic model having the sound propagation uh, in, in mind. So there is a, a, a medical sensor data like uh, uh, stuff that you have to wear to, to monitor a heart rate or something like that so, or acoustic sensing for intrusion detection detection or the sensing actually for intrusion detection and target tracking, but nothing for, for actual acoustical sensing. Uh, we are relying, as I said, to, to Aaron Lehman's MATLAB code for, to some extent, but we actually improve it so that it could be applicable to really big data sets uh, uh, because uh, they are operating on, on the whole signal and when you try to run that code, you, you get out of memory pretty much easily, so we refactor all that to, to operate on, on the data chunks. There is this FP7 project called IRIT, which a lot of contribution in, in acoustical sensing apply in the smart uh, city environment and, and this energy efficiency environment. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, sensor synergy with uh, trying to, to combine uh, acoustic sensing with the other sensing to actually make a, a sense much richer and, and, and do a intelligence on, on top of that. There are new uh, platforms available. This Internet of Things uh, uh, arena is, is just piping and bringing the new... Uh, I'm running out of time, apparently. This, this new uh, platforms and uh, we, we did a, a little bit of a voice interface based on a cloud base so that you can have your sensors and you can issue the, the voice commands and stuff like that. So just quickly to conclude, yes, we, de we developed a new uh, traffic model. Uh, it can have a, a lower the cost because you're doing a simulation prior to actually uh, uh, doing uh, uh, deployment. And a really interesting result is 
that significant uh, bandwidth saving is, uh, is possible with really uh, simple uh, energy-based algorithm like we propose here. Um, so that will be all. Thank you for your attention. in coffee break. Yeah. <laughs> the session is completed. Uh, thank you for your contributions.